In a remarkable and telling moment of journalism, a BBC radio presenter recently engaged in a live interview with an Israeli spokesperson, David Mensi, that has quickly gone viral, leaving a lasting impression on those who have followed the ongoing conflict in the Middle East. This interview, however, was not just another routine interaction. It marked a significant turning point in how Israeli narratives are being challenged and scrutinized in global media. Mense, who has a history of facing tough interviews, notably from a Norwegian journalist who exposed his false claims about civilian casualty levels in Gaza, once again found himself in the spotlight. Despite his insistence on his Middle Eastern roots, Mensi's crisp British accent and polished demeanour have often been seen as a tool to lend credibility to the narratives he pushes. But this time, his usual tactics of playing the victim and diverting attention from Israel's controversial actions fell flat. The BBC journalist, well prepared and unwilling to let dubious claims go unchallenged, pressed Mensi on the unverified assertions he made about Israel's human rights record. The result was a revealing exchange where Mense, clearly caught off guard, stuttered and struggled to maintain his composure throughout the interview. This exchange is more than just a viral moment. It symbolizes the unraveling of Israel's long-standing media strategy. For decades, Israel has successfully positioned itself as the perpetual victim, often using this narrative to deflect criticism from its actions in the occupied Palestinian territories. This strategy, bolstered by a well-oiled public relations machine, has allowed Israel to gain sympathy and support from Western audiences, who often see the conflict through a lens that obscures the realities on the ground. However, this approach is showing signs of wear. The interview with Mense is a clear indication that the world's patience with Israel's narrative is wearing thin. The facade of victimhood that Israel has carefully cultivated is no longer sufficient to mask the stark realities of its policies and actions, which many now view as indefensible. The crumbling of this narrative is particularly evident in the way journalists, who once might have been more sympathetic to Israel's position, are now more willing to ask the hard questions and challenge the rhetoric that has long gone unexamined. Israeli human rights organization B'Tselem said the other day that there are torture camps for Palestinians in the prison and in the military detention system in Israel. People can see the videos that Israeli soldiers have posted on social media where they're taking selfies next to and videos next to bound and blindfolded detainees or they're filming uh, blowing up Palestinian homes to commemorate the the deaths of soldiers in a in a Hamas ambush. It's it's all these elements which which are combining to to paint a picture of the way that Israel is waging this war. So is this your impression of impartial impartial news coverage, Michelle? Because I think you just uh, um, warrant uh, the Palestinian pro Palestinian reporter of the year award, and I congratulate you for that. So these are the facts. We were attacked on October the 7th, not in a war that we wanted. We were invaded. They want to destroy our country. It's been controlled by Iran. We have a duty to our own people. We have a, uh, we are mandated by Israel's people as a democracy to defend this country. That's precisely what we'll do. We will always get a people out of harm's way. All of the global experts on urban warfare, warfare all say the same thing, that we've achieved the gold standard when it comes to targeting our war against the terrorists and keeping civilians out of harm's way. Torture. What's the answer to the torture camps for Palestinians that B'Tselem have spoken of? So there's no, I mean, there's there's no such thing. Uh, that simply doesn't exist. Uh, we do have an issue in that we have arrested many uh, terrorists. Uh, we have arrested them, and we've been had an influx of uh, terrorist terrorist suspects into our prison, and we have had to uh, make accommodations for them. We didn't expect to, to have. Uh, tens of thousands of terrorists coming into our prison system. Does accommodation uh, so we are mean adjusting to them? It. That is appalling. That's an appalling accusation. And without any, you um, pr uh, producing reports on this uh, war, and it is a war, um, one-sidedly, without context, what it does, it ends up with attacks on Jews on the streets of Britain. You seem to be dismissing the deaths of 81 people as a PR coup for Hamas. These are Mothers, children, these are families, many of whom have been displaced from other parts of Gaza who wouldn't have any, anywhere else to go, who very probably had very little choice about where 
they were able to get shelter, whether or not Hamas were using the same building. So, Jane, uh, firstly, that's quite offensive to say that. Uh, My point to you is that we released the photographs of 19 terrorists with blood on their hands, their names, their crimes, the organisation, and we targeted them and we defeated them. We we used extremely precise intelligence. Our footage, and we've released this footage, shows very clearly there were no civilians in the area at the time of the blast. Look, we have That's to wake up... That's not what Save the Children say, though. Right. And they, they are me, also there we, on the ground. We need to have our eyes open on this. On This This is this is a PR battle which we are facing as well. You know, Hamas wants these images to be shown in the Western media. Our uh, info is that we got these 19 uh, terrorists. Uh, we're pleased about that because... Um, you know, the world's a better place without them. We can move on uh, in our battle to uh, but, but try and restore peace. But what about the other 81 is, is my there point. Are, there aren't any 81. That's the truth of the matter. There aren't any That is any not other. what charities are saying there. Right. So, unfortunately, uh, uh, lots of people like UNRWA, which is also a charity, they're actual, um, p- they actually participated but, but this October is Save the Children. This isn't, this isn't Unruh. So I this don't save, know save about children. Save the Children. Mm. But what I, what I know is, is this is a PR battle. I've given you our intelligence. We know that 19 were killed. We're looking into if there are, uh, were any other uh, collateral damage, which, of course, uh, we'll apologise for if that is the case. But what I'm telling you is we can say categorically when we... Uh, fired these precise munitions, calibrated perfectly to get precisely to the terrorists to to make sure there aren't any civilian casualties. There weren't any um, other civilians in the area. So any other um, um, you know ideas which might come afterwards, it's incumbent on world media to be critical, to look at these issues with a critical eye, because Hamas have a history of lying. I mean, you know, none of us here in Israel are surprised. They raped our our families. They burnt whole families alive. You know, it's no big surprise that they happen to be liars as well. well but this I understand is, this for isn't Western Hamas media. That I'm, I'm certainly quoting here. It's the charity Save the Children. So you... almost, Jane, this is an important point because mm. almost nothing, no information leaves. Gaza without it being cleared. It, by it would help if international journalists were allowed in there by Israel, then we would be able to give independent verification, but, but you don't allow us in, so we can't. Can I just put one final Jane, point to you? Whatever, that's, that's whatever what happened call a on drive Saturday. By. That's what you call a drive-by. Allow me to respond to that uh, when you make that accusation. This yep. has been one of the most reported conflicts ever. But I think. not freely by the international well, media. The international well, media, Sky media News, are only allowed in, it. accompanied by Israel media on very, very limited it. trips. It is a very dangerous war zone uh, for the safety of these journalists, but we're keeping them out, but we will let that, them That's in a decision that, that you've just duty. acknowledged. You are keeping them out. No, the decision I'm taking, I'm, I'm telling you about, is that we're focusing on bringing our hostages home. That's what our emphasis is, you know, because the story's getting out. I mean, you see them on your, on your, on your screens every single moment of every single day. So the story is getting out. So this idea that there isn't, it isn't getting out is ridiculous. It's on, it's on our front screens all the time. But it's, it's hard priority. because if I say a fact and then you say it's, it's Hamas, we can't, we can't independently verify it because you won't let us in. So it, it becomes a circular argument, doesn't it? The, whatever happened on Saturday, Day. We've seen the images. We've spoken to save the children. Do you think what happened on Saturday helps the chances of your hostages getting out safely that so many in Israel want to desperately see? So from the top of the government down, all of us want to see our hostages home. It's an open sore in Israeli society. It's, it's a terrible thing which has happened to our people 311 days now in uh, Hamas's uh, grips. But let me um, let you in on our, our military strategy. We know what works with Hamas. Up until now, Hamas have walked away from every, uh, every time, except for the occasion in November, they've walked away every time when, there's been, when we're getting close to a hostage release deal. You know what works with Hamas? It is comprehensive military pressure against them. That's how we hold their feet to the fire, and that's how we get our hostages back, because that is the military strategy which actually pays dividends. If we can't send them an email, we can't make a polite request for them to send our people home, it's when they feel the pressure against their fighters, against their terrorist force, that's when they negotiate. And that's the policy which we are have already shown to have been successful, and that's what will bring results. It's- One of the most significant aspects of this interview is the shift in perception 
among those who have previously sympathized with Israel, especially in the aftermath of the October 7th attack. The events of that day, marked by a surprise attack on Israel, initially drew widespread condemnation of the perpetrators and a wave of support for Israel's right to defend itself. However, as more information has emerged, and as the dust has settled, a growing number of journalists and commentators are beginning to reconsider the root causes of the violence. They are recognizing that the actions and policies of Israel over the years, particularly its treatment of Palestinians and the ongoing occupation, have created the conditions that led to such a desperate and violent response. The expulsion of Palestinians from their homes, the relentless expansion of Israeli settlements into Palestinian territories, and the systematic undermining of Palestinian sovereignty have all contributed to a climate of despair and resistance. It is a painful irony that the very policies designed to secure Israel's dominance in the region have instead sown the seeds of enduring conflict and resistance. Just listen to Mensa being destroyed with facts by the BBC radio presenter. The journalist's line of questioning highlighted these issues, forcing Mensi to confront the uncomfortable truth that Israel's policies have not only failed to bring about lasting peace, but have also perpetuated a cycle of violence and retaliation. Had Israel pursued a path of genuine diplomacy, respecting the territorial rights of Palestinians and working towards a just solution, the situation might have been different. But instead, the refusal to engage in meaningful dialogue, coupled with aggressive policies of land appropriation and military force, has only deepened the divide and made peace an increasingly distant prospect. Mensa's attempt to justify these policies during the interview was met with a barrage of facts that he could not easily dismiss, leaving him visibly shaken and unable to coherently defend Israel's actions. James O'Brien, speaking during his LBC news program, nailed the most important point about Israel's barbarism, which Western media have largely ignored. I also have to now draw your attention to a, another story, which is, I think, <laughs> although nobody has died, in some ways it's even worse. And this is a story uh, about a protest continuing protests at, um, uh, well, in, in Israel, where essentially protesters, politicians, and TV commentators are defending the right of soldiers to mistreat and even, and this is where the trigger warnings come in, rape Palestinian prisoners in detention. Now, I first saw this on the Al Jazeera channel, the Al Jazeera English channel, which is one of the outlets that uh, still manages to have reporters on the ground in Gaza. Of course, uh, that is not something that many British news organisations are able to do because Israel won't let them. And because Al Jazeera is Qatari-owned and clearly has an editorial slant... You, you, I, I tread carefully. Whether I should or not, I don't know. But the report that I saw <clears throat> was absolutely clear because it, it, it includes footage from Israeli television. It includes footage of Israeli politicians. It includes the Twitter feeds of uh, Israeli public figures. And the contention of these protesters grew from reports of... IDF soldiers, army reservists, a leaked video, and this is the biggest trigger warning of all, a leaked video of Israeli soldiers torturing and raping a Palestinian prisoner in circumstances that I don't think I can legally share fully with you at 12 minutes after 10 on a British, on a regulated British radio station. I don't think I can give you the details. I can tell you that the video uh, uh, has been broadcast. I can tell you that the place where this torture took place was, uh, and I'll probably mispronounce it, Stay Tayman. It's two words, S-D-E, new word T-E-I-M-A-N. Thousands of detainees from the Gaza Strip were brought there after mass arrests by soldiers. Um, this is from Haaretz, an Israeli newspaper, I, I, over 100 years old, uh, and they have reported that very slowly the full dimensions of the horror 
emerged. Stay Tayman was a place where the most horrible torture we had ever seen was occurring. Um, the testimonies from people serving at the facility or from inmates who had been released were frightening. This included inhumane conditions and abuse, including sexual abuse, sleep deprivation, the playing of extremely loud music for long stretches and severe physical violence. It's not for nothing that Stay Tayman has been called the Israeli Guantanamo. But it gets worse. The video of soldiers apparently raping a prisoner in this detention center has prompted protests in defense of the soldiers. I'll say that again. In defense of the soldiers. Supporters of the Israeli government or elements of the Israeli government, up to and including Israeli politicians, made their way to where they thought the soldiers were being held and tried to affect their release. I'll, I'll say that again. A mob of Israeli protesters made its way to the facility where they thought the soldiers, a filmed apparently raping a prisoner, were being held, and they sought to illegally affect their release. The soldiers have now been released. I think all of them have now been placed under house arrest. They've been released from the um, military incarceration and, and placed under house arrest. And protesters shouting, this is Sodom, a, 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 an Old Testament reference, of course, to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, are arguing publicly that Israeli soldiers should be able to mistreat Palestinian detainees however they want. This is part of the defense of the same soldiers who were arrested for the abuse of the male Palestinian prisoner at the Stay Tayman base. And Israel is our ally. Uh, as I say, the reservists, I think, have now been released. Certainly some of them have put into house arrest. And politicians and journalists have, have joined in. So here is an Israeli journalist called Yehuda Schlesinger filmed on Israeli television. I, I stress that point. This is from last week. Uh, he says, I don't give a rat's ass what they do, speaking of the soldiers, uh, to that Hamas man, speaking of the prisoner. I always remember, first of all, the only problem for me here is that it's not a regulated policy of the state to abuse the detainees. I, 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 a stone-cold war crime, which he thinks should actually be uh, legally ratified in Israel because he says first they deserve it and it's great revenge that we should give them. So the idea that Israeli uh, 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 atrocities enjoy support from public figures up to and including the point where they claim that they have every right to be every bit as uh, abominable and barbaric as ha Hamas members were on the October the 7th terror attack it has become completely irrefutable. He adds that it may also serve as a deterrent. Um, he has since called his comments a mistake, so it would appear that there is still uh, a point beyond which Israeli public figures are currently not prepared to go. Israel's Channel 12 aired a leaked video of the alleged assault. Again, I stress that in case you're thinking of wasting time telling me not to trust Al Jazeera. So Israel's own Channel 12 aired a leaked video of the alleged assault, prompting uh, Bezalel Smotrich, who remains a member of Benjamin Netanyahu's government, to say that those who leaked the video should be prosecuted and not the soldiers. The implications of this interview extend far beyond the immediate exchange between Mensah and the BBC presenter. It reflects a broader shift in the global discourse surrounding Israel and Palestine. The days when Israel could rely on unquestioned support from Western media are fading as more journalists and observers begin to hold Israel accountable for its actions. This is not just about a single interview, but about a changing tide in public opinion. The world is becoming more aware of the complexities of the conflict and more critical of the narratives that have dominated the discourse for so long. The challenge now for Israel is to recognize this shift and reconsider its approach, both in terms of its policies on the ground and its strategies in the court of public opinion. The interview with David Menzies is a microcosm of a larger change that is taking place. It shows that the world is no longer willing to accept simplistic narratives or unverified claims.
The Israeli government and its representatives can no longer rely on their usual tactics to win sympathy or deflect criticism. The walls of their media appeal, where they have long played the victim while committing serious violations of human rights are beginning to crumble. As journalists and the global public continue to question and challenge these narratives, Israel will have to confront the reality that its policies are not just unsustainable, but increasingly indefensible. This interview was not just a moment of journalistic triumph, but a sign of the times, a clear indication that the world is waking up to the truth and is no longer willing to be misled by false narratives and victimhood rhetoric.